Rosa Patrice everyone and happy new year for those of you who attended the last class we finished up with chapter three and there saint paul was teaching us that we are all sons and daughters of god all of you are children of god because you have been baptized because of your faith in christ jesus all of you who were baptized in christ clothe yourselves with christ you put on christ and because of that there is no jew no greek no slave and no free person there is no male and female because you are all one in christ jesus what a beautiful state of unity this was quite a revolutionary statement from saint paul especially during those times where 90 percent of the people were slaves saint paul said there is there is you might be a slave might be working for someone as a slave you you might be bought but this does not hinder your freedom in christ in christ jesus we're all free there's no ethnicity because we're all citizens of the kingdom of god we're all citizens of the upper jerusalem and that means male female black white color doesn't matter gender does not matter because all these things are forms of this age souls are not male or female the gender male female just like the form of marriage are for this life for this earthly life in the kingdom of god there is no male or female no marriage all these things cease to exist and because we are descendants and the seed of abraham we are heirs according to the promise of god so we are the children of abraham all of us who believe in christ whether jew or gentile male or female free or slave we're all heirs in accordance with the promise of god in the old testament to abraham and saint paul continues in chapter four i now say up to as long of a time that the heir is a small child he differs nothing from a slave though he's owner of all yet he's under guardians and under trustees until the set time of the father so here in the beginning of the chapter saint paul uses a metaphor in the old testament we were under the law and no one could really keep the law because there were 613 different different mandates and no one was able to keep the law except our lord jesus christ he's speaking about the spiritual infancy of the old testament and a lot of people don't understand why the god of the old testament is supposedly more harsh he becomes angry and uh, he destroys people and this has nothing to do with god it has to do with the state of the people they were at a state of spiritual infancy so when a child is small and they do not have the maturity then you have to have guidelines for them someone can be a prince or a princess and even though they are going to be the owner and the future king of the kingdom yes they have to be under administrators they have they have to be told to go to school they have to be taught when to uh, go to sleep they're not free they're under guardians and administrators until the set time of the father so that's how we all were before we had an awakening in our faith we were enslaved by the basic principles of the world and this is a very difficult verse but we were enslaved by what the world does we needed to keep up with the rest of the world we believed in zodiac signs we were enslaved to these things and to our superstitions but all these things are simply elements of this world but when the fullness of time came god sent out his son born from a woman born under law so that he may redeem those under the law and we'll probably spend most of our time 
on uh, in these verses because I don't know if any of you remember this, but this is the very epistle of the liturgy of the birth of Christ, of nativity. I was studying the other day when I was reading the epistle of Christ's baptism of Epiphany, St. John the Chrysostom was commenting on that very epistle of Titus, Epiphanius Sotir, the Savior has appeared. The same epistle that we heard in church a few days ago, that same epistle was being interpreted by St. John the Chrysostom 1600 years ago, which shows that the Orthodox Church is the Church of the Apostles and the original Church of Christ. But when the fullness of time came, what is this fullness of time? Many different things needed to fall in place before the fullness of time would come. The starting point of this fullness of time would be found in Genesis. It would start in Genesis. After we fell from paradise, after the fall, and after God the Logos, Christ before the incarnation, after he reprimanded Adam and Eve, Adam, where are you? Eve, how could you do this? The snake, the serpent, made me do it. And then at the, at the end of that conversation, God, the word of God, tells the serpent, actually the devil, who was hiding inside the serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In Greek, we call this the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, the devil, and the woman, and between your seed, your demons, and those who follow you, and her seed. Have you ever heard of a woman having seed? Seed belongs to men only, regardless of what the agenda says today, the agenda of the globalists, which is really the agenda of the Antichrist. It's the agenda of the seed of the demons. That's what this agenda is. Between your seed and her seed. Her seed are the Christians, but more specifically the leader of the Christians, Christ. He shall bruise your head. He will crush your head through his ministry. And we saw that happen during Christ's baptism in the Jordan River. He was baptized to crush the head of the serpents. When he went into the Jordan River, his uncreated energy sizzled the demons who were lurking in the water. And the final demise of the devil took place on the cross when Christ went into Hades and he crushed the head and the dominion of the devil by freeing all the souls that were prepared for the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament. They were prepared by Saint John the Baptist who died two and a half years before. So that's where the fullness of time is beginning to assemble. And many things needed to take place. It was the fullness of time when Christ came because sin reached its highest dimension. Because the darkness in the world could not be any higher. So when the fullness of time came, God sent his son born from a woman and not through a woman. It was Nestorius who said that Christ came through the Virgin Mary, just like through a conduit. But that's blasphemy because if he did not take our blood, our human nature, what is not assumed, it cannot be saved. So that's why Nestorius was an antichrist and a great blasphemer when he said that God the Logos was different from Jesus. Christ received his nature. He created his own nature in the womb of the virgin, where the union of the two natures took place. This is the greatest thing under the sun, greatest mystery, the mystery of the incarnation. So the fullness of time is from the fall until the incarnation, which took place in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So once again, many things needed to take place. Christ needed to follow humankind through the ages and to make different covenants with Noah. First of all, the sixth one from Adam, Enoch. As we can see, even after the fall, there was a few people that used the innate law of God. 
they used the image of God inside of them to reach holiness. Enoch, the sixth one from Adam, who after he lived close to 300 years, he had such a state of repentance. He began to become so close to God that just like Elijah was taken up and he's still alive today. And just like Elijah, he will come back during the second coming of Christ to minister to the Jews and the Gentiles. These two great prophets will be put to death in Jerusalem. And after three days, their bodies will resurrect and they will go up to paradise to stay for a little while until the second coming of Christ. So we needed all these things to come together. We had the covenant with Noah, the destruction of all humanity with a flood because they became flesh. And then after Noah, we would have Abraham. And we see how Abraham did not have any law. He simply used the law of his conscience. The same thing with, with Noah and Job. St. John Chrysostom says it's a shame that God had to give us a written law because his law is already written in our conscience. We also have the priest Melchizedek that Abraham met. He was a priest of God. He was a priest of the true God, Melchizedek. And he is a prefigurement and a typology of Christ, the archpriest. And then we have the law of Moses and the Israelites who by giving the law, the law would prepare them to cut their iniquity and bridle their passions, circumcise their hearts. That was the idea of the law and circumcision to circumcise their hearts to mature so they could accept the perfect law of freedom, which is Christianity. So we saw in the prophets and especially in the prophetic words of Daniel, we saw prophecies about the, the first coming of Christ and the 70 weeks of Daniel. Prophet Daniel, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament and very beloved of God, went into Babylon very young and he stayed there most of his life. And there he explained the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about the four kingdoms. The statue in a dream of Nebuchadnezzar had a head of gold, chest of silver, bronze in its belly, and feet of clay and iron. And there Daniel explains that these are four different kingdoms that will follow you, O great king Nebuchadnezzar. But during the fourth kingdom, kingdom of clay and iron, the king of heaven will establish his kingdom and this kingdom will have no end. And this kingdom is Christianity. It was prophesied in his dreams that Christ will be born during the Roman Empire. The third kingdom was the kingdom of the Greeks. And Alexander the Great, who was indeed great, and please do not believe anything Hollywood tries to teach you about Alexander. He was extremely ethical based on history and the historical facts of that era. He was a great believer and he respected the gods of his time. And God appeared to him. Christ, the Logos, appeared to him and told him, when you go to Jerusalem, do not harm the city. I will give you the keys to Jerusalem. When he went to Jerusalem, the priest came out and he came down from his horse. And his general said, Alexander, what is wrong with you? You are the conqueror of these people. You're ready to conquer the earth and you went down to bow down in front of the priest and he told him, please stop. You don't know who appeared to me in a dream a couple of days ago and told me to respect this city because it belongs to him. And yes, the priest took him in the temple of Solomon and showed him the prophecy of Daniel. And it was Alexander who took the Greek civilization and the Greek language all over the known world because the Greek language was needed to express the theological doctrines of Christianity. The English language needed to borrow 42,000 Greek words. Greek language is the language of science and theology. After Alexander, the Roman Empire is permitted by God to come and create a unity throughout the known world. The Romans would enter different territories and would ask the people to become subservient to them. And once they would pay a certain tax, they were free to live their lives, much like modern mafia does today. Pay our money and we'll protect you. The problem with the, the Roman Empire, it was, it was a very strong empire administratively, had a very strong army, but it was not so homogeneous. It was multicultural. And that's why you have many different rebellions and some of the most rebellious people during 
during the Roman Empire were the Jews. But God used the Roman Empire because it would make it very easy for the apostles to travel with some safety throughout those territories of the Roman Empire. So St. Paul was able to travel very easily and the rest of the apostles. St. Paul was even a Roman citizen because Asia Minor simply became subservient to the Roman Empire. So the apostles needed to be born. St. John the Baptizer needed to be born. Joachim and Anna to bring the Panagia. All these things needed to come together so we can have this fullness of time for Christ to be born of a woman. Again, that woman of Genesis is the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman. The great prophecy about the ever virginity of the Most Holy Theotokos and also the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But when the fullness of time came, God sent out his son. He sent him out from heaven, from the bosom of the father, his only begotten son. He did not send an angel. He did not send a seraphim or a cherubim or an archangel. He sent out his only begotten son. The word of God became flesh. And he was born from a woman. And he was born under law. The Greek does not use an article because the scriptures here, the Spirit of God has in mind both laws. We have the law of the conscience, as I said, the innate law, and then later we had the law of Moses. And not a single human being was able to keep the law of the conscience or the law of Moses. Only Christ pleased God 100% because he was sinless. He never sinned with his conscience, with his mind, and he kept the entire law of Moses regardless of what the deluded Pharisees and scribes used to think. So he was born under the law so that he may redeem those under law. And he did that on the cross. He took our sins and drowned them in the Jordan River initially, and then eventually he washed us with his blood on the cross. And that's why Daniel the prophet will see all this 483 years before the birth of Christ when he speaks about that amazing prophecy of the 70 weeks, 70 heptads, 70 times 7, 400 and 90 years and this prophecy breaks down to 62 weeks and then one week 49 years and I'm not going to go into the details because I did this lecture about 10 years ago somewhere in Baltimore but you can see the amazing prophecy of Daniel who spells out even the time 490 years from now the Messiah will be born transgression will be finished our sins will be forgiven all the transgressions of the Old Testament will be washed in the blood of the Lamb the Messiah will make an end of sins Daniel 9:24 to make reconciliation for iniquity we will no longer be enemies of God we will were enemies of God. And after Christ's ascension, when he sat at the right hand of the Father, then God sent his Holy Spirit in the world during Pentecost. And reconciliation took place between the iniquitous men and heaven to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy. All the prophecies of the Old Testament pertaining to the Messiah have been fulfilled during the first coming of Christ and to anoint the Most High. The anointing took place in the Jordan River. What a beautiful prophecy. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again. It's talking about the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. The Messiah will be killed willfully. He'll go on the cross, but not for himself. He didn't need to do this for himself. He was sinless. He did it for us. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. The people of the prince... Titus, the Roman emperor with his son, will come and destroy the city because of the sin of those citizens that refused their Messiah, those who put him on the cross. And that's why the city was destroyed and the sanctuary. All this in the book of Daniel, 480 some years before Christ. And the end of it shall be with a flood. 
That's exactly what hit Jerusalem. It was such a cataclysmic destruction, worse than a flood. It's been written and said that the Romans made a field out of Jerusalem. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So all the prophecies of the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Christ. The law has been fulfilled. And he did all this so he may redeem those under the law of Moses and the law of our conscience so that we may receive adoption. So we can become sons and daughters of God again. The last time we were his sons and daughters was in the Garden of Eden. After the fall, we decided not to be his sons when we clearly followed the plan of the devil and we became enemies of God. We became his enemies. We became his estranged children because of the fall, but he did not abandon us. He continued to care for us by sending holy people, making new covenants, prophets to bring us back, just like the parable of the prodigal son beautifully explains. So he did all this so we can become once again sons and daughters of God. Inatin iothesian apolavomen. So we can become sons and daughters of God. And that happens through our baptism. Again, we hear this all the time. We're all children of God. Yes, we are. We were created by God. But specifically, to become brothers of Christ, we need to, to be grafted on his body, to be baptized. And in the gospel of the resurrection, in the first chapter of John, John says, He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But those who received him, those who believed in him, he gave them the power to become children of God. So only those who believe in Christ are brothers of Christ and sons of God the Father, sons and daughters of God the Father. It is after the resurrection that Christ will tell Mary Magdalene, go tell my brothers, the apostles, they're my brothers. And he gave them the authority to forgive sins. All the apostles, not just Peter, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the authority, the power to loosen and bind sins here on earth. And whatever you loosen, and on earth will be loosed in heaven. And because you are sons, God sent out the Spirit of His Son. The Spirit of His Son. The Holy Spirit, also called the Spirit of Christ, in your hearts, into our inner hearts. For those of you who have been paying attention to the words during a holy baptism, you'll see the priest actually command the devil to come out of the heart of the child or the adult that's being baptized. Because before our baptism, the demonic energy was in our heart. And now after we renounce Satan and we renounce his pomp and we renounce all his activities, then after that, the Spirit of God comes and lives in our hearts. The seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the different gifts of the Holy Spirit that we receive so we can continue our spiritual journey. So ex apestulin, God sent out the Spirit of His Son. Here we're speaking about the energy of the Holy Spirit because the energies of the Holy Spirit are common to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The Trinity has one common essence and one common energy, but each person has its personal hypostatic attributes. The Father is unbegotten and without a cause. The Son is born by the Father and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But the energy of the Holy Spirit is sent out to the world through the Father and the Son. To give you a simple example, which does not capture this mystery, of course, we have the sun in the sky. The sun ray comes forth from the sun, from the mass in the sky, and along with the ray comes the warmth. We have the light and the warmth. So the sun and the Holy Spirit come into the world together, just like during the visitation of the Trinity to Abraham, right before Sodom and Gomorrah there in Genesis, where after the conversation with Abraham, the one person of the Trinity stayed behind and the two persons went to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is symbolic of the, uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit going out into the world for God's holy economy. And because you are sons, God sent out the Spirit of His Son in your hearts. And it is the Holy Spirit 
I will cry out, will inspire you to begin to cry out to your Father in heaven. Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word, and St. Paul translates it. It says, Abba, Father. It's not the Holy Spirit that cries out, but the faithful. Holy Spirit is inside of us and helps us to cry out in sighs and different prayers to call out to our God the Father. And this is an indication that we have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot conceptualize and understand and even accept that we have a Father in heaven. So that you are no longer a slave, but a son. Now, if you are a son, you are also an heir of God. What an amazing revelation. Something that most of us, most of us Christians, we don't live these realities. And we go about our lives depressed, troubled, miserable, because the world esteems people and appraises people according to what they have, according to their net worth. Even if you're a king, Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great who conquered the whole world. When Alexander died, he gave an order to leave his hands hanging outside of the casket to preach a great truth that no matter if you conquer the whole world, if you own the whole world, you will leave this planet empty-handed. When are we going to realize this? That in Christianity, we are not appraised according to what we have, according to our careers, according to our looks, according to our fame. All those things are clay, earthly. They'll vanish. The greatest gift that we have, the greatest gift that we ever received during Christmas was the gift of Christ himself, his body and blood, and the fact that we are his brothers. I call you brothers. I call you my friends. This is the greatest treasure. And that last homeless person that believes and, and has his trust in God and he lives a life in Christ Jesus is much wealthier than all these globalists who own 90% of the world's wealth and want to enslave us once again. 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire enslaved the whole world and gave them some basic freedoms. But you need it to have permission from the Roman authorities if your God would be included in the Roman pantheon. You could worship your idols and any God you wanted to, but you needed to have permission from Rome. Judaism received that permission and the Romans tolerated the Jews. What made Christians dangerous was the fact that they had an absolute God. They would not worship the emperor of Rome was also considered one of the gods at the time. Exactly what we are witnessing today. It is very dangerous to speak the truth today. The new world order suppresses the truth. The media suppresses the truth because they are in the service of the Antichrist. And just like back then, when Nero began to burn the Christians on stakes and he would light them up at nights to illumine the streets of Rome, he was considered one of the Antichrist by his contemporary Christians. In the same way, the globalists today, they are paving the Pax Romana of our days for the Antichrist who's going to change times and law. He's going to change the law of God and the law of nature. So today, just like back then, Rome was trying to unite the world for political reasons. In the same way, the globalist agenda wants to unite the world because we're not interested in boundaries and nations. We want one nation, a multicultural nation under the rule of the Antichrist. It's not enough to just have political unity, but we also want religious unity. And this is why you have all these different hierarchs of ours always visiting and praying with Jews and Hindus and pagans and all the different religions of the earth because the Antichrist wants to unite all religions and eventually he will eliminate all religions and call himself the God of the universe. And this is why we're doing these lessons to stay vigilant, to help us and remind us the great truths of the scriptures and these prophecies. The book of Revelation is being displayed in front of us. All these things will be obvious to the vigilant, to those who have the Spirit of Christ in their heart. <laughs> Oh,